So today, some of you have heard about my research before. I look at these gorgeous little wooden funerary figures. Uh, they look like a doll to a lot of people, but they're actually not. Um, we're quite unsure of their exact function. It seems there's something to do with sustenance in the afterlife. So these things are part of a bigger model. They get it put in a tomb, and they magically come to life in the afterlife and provide the sustenance the deceased is going to need. Uh, this is now my third year of my study, so I've been traveling all around the country, collecting up all this data, and now I've had to figure out what I'm actually going to do with it. So I've been to 64 different museums and institutions. I'm looking at over 1,800 figures in total. So yeah, it's a lot. I have a mixture of provenance, proposed provenance, and unprovenance figures. So in some cases, it will say it's from Thebes, but it doesn't say why the figure is thought to be from Thebes. Is that a true provenance? Is that something someone has thought in the past and not justified? Things get a little bit murky. That's what I'm hoping to clear up. So as I've said, they kind of provide sustenance in the afterlife. I'm trying to really quickly skip through this to get to the more fun stuff. Uh, a guy called Herbert Winlock, he found the Mechet Ray figures, the gorgeous, beautiful offering bearers that you have in the MMA and in the Cairo Museum. He said these would have been played with during life by the grandchildren. They were little dolls' houses that the children would have played with. No evidence for this whatsoever, but I just like it. And there is no word that encompasses these figures. We don't find them in any of the texts, any reference to this as a burial good. So we are really relying on our own interpretations. The second issue I face with these figures is post-excavation, they get messed with. They get reassembled to make them more attractive. If a figure's missing an arm, I've got a spare arm over here, I'll stick that one on. Some of them, initially you look at them and think that's fine. You look a little closer, that's actually a left arm stuck on the right arm. Other ones, it's very, very clearly not a match, and why anyone would attach it is beyond me. It's a really, really nice mix. So as I said, I've been doing a lot of traveling over the last couple of years. I've had lots and lots of train picnics. I've had lots and lots of rail replacement bus services. Here's a little distribution map showing uh, where all the figures are in the country. Lots and lots in London. I've had lots and lots of fun adventures. Obviously, this doesn't cover everything. If I can't get hold of a museum, or they don't have any information available online. If I don't know about it, I can't include it. But this is the best I've been able to do so far. Examination in person really, really does make a difference. And the more I've been traveling around and seeing these things in person, I've seen a photo of them before I've gone, I have a completely different interpretation from actually handling the figure and getting to know them. So 1,383 of these guys I've met in person. I've got a good chunk as well that I've seen from photographs that are of good enough quality. Some of them, I know they exist, but I'm not actually able to access them or get a decent enough photo, but I still want to include them just to give us a better idea of the corpus. And then there's obviously ones I don't know about, but I can't include those in the catalogue. As you see here, we have these lovely tomb labels as well, uh, museum labels as well. I've tried to keep a record of those when an object's on display because that also affects how these things are interpreted. So as you can imagine, I've been a little bit overwhelmed with this massive amount of data. I've recorded 77 stylistic traits for each figure, times that by the 1,820 figures I've got. We're looking at a lot of data, and there's about six images for each figure as well, because I take a picture from every single side. An Excel sheet is not going to cut this anymore. It's really, really not going to work. Luckily, uh, as I was doing my MA at the Egypt Centre in Swansea, I was fortunate enough to work with them and build them a new online catalogue. So I've managed to reutilize some of this software for my own needs. So this is what the front page looks like. And as you can see along the top here, I've got all these little stylistic features that relate to each figure. So we've got hairstyle, eyebrows, the eyes. If we were to choose hairstyle, I can then break it down to which type of hairstyle. So in the case of this chap here on the right, he's got a flared smooth wig. But I can then go down a layer again and say it's a cheap length wig as well. So I'm really, really narrowing down and drilling into the data for easy comparison later on. It's also really nice, I can then search by these things. So for this example, I've pulled up all the images that have a cloak. There are 77 in total in my catalog. And because you've got these images included, I can really easily have a look and see which one's gonna match whatever I'm looking for. So now my big thing, the thing I'm trying to do is try and find provenance for some of these guys. I've got over a quarter where they have a known provenance. And by that, I mean I have seen the records of this figure. It's definitely come from somebody like Petrie or Garstang, so we know it's definitely coming from a good provenance. 
Some of them I've been able to identify by the tomb number. So particularly in the case of the Beni Hassan figures, some of them, when you turn them over, they've actually got the tomb number written on the back. Fasting has his grave register, so I'm able to match the two up conclusively. I've been lucky enough to use some of the Garstang's archival photographs of the Beni Hassan excavations, for example. There's a few images from sediment as well. In those cases, you can clearly see this figure is so unique, it has to be that one in that image. So that's really, really helpful as well. As you can see, I've had a good go. I've got 208 that I've proposed provenance for, and I'm going to explain to you how I did that in a minute. But this is still ongoing work. I've still got over 600 I'm working on. I started with the nice, easy ones. Now I'm getting to the slightly trickier ones. So I've built a software tool called the, provenance, uh, the Profile Proposer. Lyra and I have had many, many discussions on what this tool is called, and we've tweaked it several times. We've come up with Profile Proposer. It breaks down into four key steps. First of all, I'm grouping the figures by their traits, then building up a profile that matches those traits, using all those stylistic traits, the 77 different things I showed you earlier. I can then match a figure with an unknown provenance or unknown origin to one of these profiles. And if there's enough within the profile, I can then hopefully restore a geographic provenance or at least a likely one. So to break that down into a bit more detail, step one, I've got to group the figures by their stylistic traits. I tried to do this using the software. It was doable, but the amount of work going into the background coding was getting so ridiculous. I thought, do you know what? This is better done by me. I have traveled around. I've seen all these figures in person. I know them. They're my friends at this point. It's easier if I just get the images and look for the really, really strong resemblances. So you can see here I've got one from Swansea, one from Bristol, Durham, Ashmolean. Not identical, they're not identical twins, but they're certainly siblings, so I can start to group these together into a profile. Once I've got that initial group, I can start to look at all these individual um, stylistic traits in the figure. So if this one, for example, has got that flared wig at the cheek length, an oval-shaped head, he's got triangular eyes, no mouth. For the colour of skin, I use a Munsell soil chart. Any archaeologists in the room? It seemed to be the right thing. I initially went to home base and started looking at their color charts, but that got far too complicated. Soil charts have been the way to go for this. So even if I'm viewing these objects in a different light, I'm still getting that consistent result. Uh, this is just a few of the traits. There's a lot more. <laughs> so once I've started to assemble these rough profiles, I then start trying to match figures of unknown provenance to them. So take the example of this nice chap here. He's from Edinburgh. The catalogue describes him as erect figure of a servant, I really don't like that word, of painted wood, ancient Egyptian. No other clues of where he's come from, how he ended up in the collection. Can we match him with some of our other figures? Yes, we can. The pro profile proposer pulls in all this data I've collected from each of the profile. He's matching Daryl Bowery type A with 100% accuracy. So I'm pretty confident he's probably going to be part of that profile. It will pull up the top three matches for me because obviously this is a computer, it's not an expert, it might have a little bit of error. So I can look at each of these profiles and see which one it's a match for. You can see the second profile it's pulled up is also Daryl Barry A, but it's a slightly different variant. These letters in blue, uh, so B-A-H is Barry, A is type A. For the first one we've got striding cropped, which is the hairstyle, and yellow skin. So we have slight variation in the profile because of a standing figure being bold. So if you're looking at a block figure, for example, the feet aren't going to be carved in the same way. So we have these variations within the profile to reflect these differences. And as I was saying, if possible, we then try and match the figure to a likely geographic provenance, or at least to a group that it probably belongs to. In the case of this profile for our Edinburgh chap, I had 15 figures in it. Nine of them are all coming from a very, very strong, definite provenance of Daryl Bahri. So I'm pretty sure he's coming from there. In fact, most of them come from tomb three. I wouldn't be confident to say, because obviously you're going to have the same people making things for different places, but tomb three does have a lot of figures that are very, very similar. So it's probably coming from around the same time period, possibly coming from the same production site. And just a couple of examples of different figures and how I've been able to match them. So these are some of the squatting Daryl Bahri guys from the same tomb. Uh, Bolton had one, uh, Bolton had two. Manchester, Bristol, Scotland, and Dumfries were all unprovenanced, but because of the couple I had in the profile that we had a possible provenance for, I can start to group these things together. These are one of my favorite guys, these little squatting guys. 
I was particularly interested in this group. The chap on the right was part of my MA thesis when I was at Swansea, and he'd been disputed as a fake. An expert had been in and said, no, there's absolutely no way he's real. The way his eyes are drawn, there's no way he can possibly be real. I've popped him into the profile provider, and sure enough, he's got lots of little friends that match with him. So I can give him a likely provenance of Daryl Bahri. So takeaways from my presentation so far. So far, the profile provider seems to be working. I've only done a small group. I've still got a lot more areas to go through. As you see, there's 600 I haven't even tackled yet. Hopefully, it will continue to work. These profiles can be used to suggest a geographic provenance and the types of activities a figure may have undertaken. So for example, these guys here, they're all gonna be rowers because they've got this hole coming through the position of the hands. By matching these tra traits together, I can start to say what type of activity they may have come from. Um, and they also help me to explore the dispersal of material as well. So the Daryl Barry ones I've shown you today, these seem to all be coming from the EES dispersal. So this helps to trace back where these materials are going, where they came from originally. Probably about 50% of them when I go through my catalog are already acknowledged as coming from the EES, so I wouldn't be surprised if the others did as well. But I have to be really careful with these things. It just takes one figure to completely skew the balance and completely change all the interpretations. This is very specific to the UK corpus. I haven't looked at the material from the rest of the world yet. I'm not allowed to. I can see Lara shaking her head at me. UK only for PhD. Potentially, I can look at a few more of it later on. But it's been really, really helpful to see where these figures have gone, where they came from originally, and you can start to track their life stories a little bit more. My main thing I want you to take away from this, although this tool is a really helpful tool, it is just that. This does not replace the expert. I've only been able to put these profiles together by seeing so many in person and interacting with them. And still, the computer is going to get it wrong sometimes. You still need to look at them once they've been assigned and make sure it does actually match up with what you're wanting it to do. And I also can't say for definite that these things come from that site. They could have been produced at Daryl Bahri and then actually interred at another site. So it, although it gives us a clue, it's never going to answer these questions. Once that dispersal has happened, once that history is lost, we can never fully replace it but we can have a really, really good go at trying to put things back together as much as we can. If you're interested in two models, these are the best books to start with. Really, really recommend the Winlock one. Historically not great, but just a really, really nice read. And thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you, Sam, for the amazing talk. Is it on YouTube or am I saying stuff? No, I'm not saying stuff. Fantastic. <laughs> cool. Um, does anyone have any questions for Sam about her sort of process, her approach to reconnecting these objects? Inte. Hello. <laughs> Once again, Sam, I'm always really uh, fascinated by all the work that you do. It's um, beyond me. But <clears throat> I was uh, thinking when you do this profile proposer, which is a um, very interesting way of uh, grouping these things together, do you foresee that in the future you could use these for other um, artifacts, like statuary, for example, or other things? Thank you, Bente. Uh, yes, absolutely. One of, in fact, the final chapter of my thesis looks at future implications and ways this can be used as a case study of a new way of approaching these things. Typological study is something that gets frowned on sometimes in archaeological circles because you are forcing things into groups that aren't necessarily how the ancient Egyptians would have grouped these things. At the same time, we've got to classify them somehow. Museums want to put them on display in groups modern audiences want to see groupings of things. So I'm trying to do it in a way that's more justified. It's really, really frustrating, as I'm sure you know from your own research, when it says, probably from the site of Mia, or possibly came via Wallace Budge, and it's, well, probably, but why are you saying that? And when you look at things like my funerary figures, they're all down as Middle Kingdom, because most of the figures come from that time. So it's very easily this approach could be transferred to other things. It could be approached as statuary, like you said. 
Uh, I've got a colleague who's working on Shabtis who might start to use some of this material as well. It's just, it's a nice way of starting your research and managing these really, really massive data sets where they're just trying to do it on your own with an Excel spreadsheet is just gonna lead to migraines. It's not gonna work. So at least this makes things a little bit easier, I'm hoping. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Over to you, Valentina. <laughs> Hi, yes, exactly. Thank you, Sam. It was uh, fascinating as usual. Uh, we have actually one comment. Brilliant talk. Thank you, Sam. And one question. Uh, some of the artifacts were wrapped. Uh, did you quantify how many were wrapped? Yes, so as one of my drop-down levels, I have whether linen is present, whether linen is not present, whether small traces of linen present, and also when you get to examine these things in person and you can really engage with them, you sometimes see the imprint of the linen as well. So you might have had linen wrapped around it originally, it's since been lost, but because the paint was still wet when it was applied, you can still see it was there. You also sometimes get wear marks as well, so around the hips and things where the linen has rubbed against the figure, that also helps as well. So I've recorded that. But obviously, if the linen is absent, that doesn't mean it was never there. And I know there were museums that removed it for aesthetic reasons and discarded it. I won't name names. But yeah, the absence doesn't prove that it was never there, but the presence can, can, can prove it was there. But again, other museums add it because they think it looks nice. So yeah, I've recorded it, but I'm trying not to read into it too much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we'll go over here. And we'll go. Yeah. Um, at what point did two models start being phased out and being replaced with Shabtis, or are they there at the same time? Thank you, that's a great question. So they seem to disappear around mid 12th dynasty. But one of the things I'm arguing in my thesis is that we need to try and avoid some of these dating things. They get whacked around quite quickly. It wasn't the first intermediate period ended that day and then the next day it was the Middle Kingdom. It's a lot more fluid. A lot of these things are dated on other objects in the burial because we don't have any inscriptions on them. So it can be really, really difficult to try and stick to these rigid dating things. Uh, the argument of whether they replace Shabtis or not is an interesting one, and nobody seems to really agree at the moment. They do serve a slightly different function. So it seems the funerary models were more to provide sustenance in the afterlife. So they would continue once your offering cult had finished because all your relatives had died and nobody remembered you anymore. These things would continue to magically produce linen, uh, produce food, take you on boat trips because you haven't got people coming to the tomb anymore. Shabtis tend to do work on behalf of the deceased. So they will go and move the sand across from the east to the west bank. And so it's like they're slightly different functions, but it does seem to be as one falls out of favor, the other one comes in, but I don't think they're a direct replacement. It's more a shift in social and religious attitudes at that time. Does that make sense? Thank you. Uh... <laughs> It's be better than that. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for that presentation. I really enjoyed it. I'm really excited about the possibilities and implications of your research and the um, software that you're developing as well. Um, and uh, I just wanted to ask about um, workshops, because you have been focusing mainly on the provenance of some of these objects. To what an extent can you identify, if at all, uh, the existence of workshops within those um, um, sites? And I have another question, actually. Do you always wear pink gloves? I'll answer the glove one first, because that's the easy one. Yes, I always wear the gloves. Campbell Price kindly gave me the hashtag, hashtag pink gloves. So it's now become my thing. It's actually really helped when people have stolen my images on social media, and you can see the pink gloves behind. If it's a pink glove, you know it's mine. <laughs> Uh, talking about production sites, uh, Gassan Eschenbremer-Dima did a really fantastic study for her PhD looking at the production sites. 
I'm shying away from it at the moment because it is so difficult to say. There are no traces of where these things came from. We have woodworking places, but it seems perhaps these were produced from the offcuts of the coffins. The Egyptians did not like to waste wood because it was so rare. And when you look at a lot of these figures that are damaged, you can see the repairs done to them. So some of them are two pieces of wood jammed together with a little dowel in. They'll fill in cracks and things with paste to try and hide these gaps and cover it all up. But it's really, really hard to trace. You can definitely see in some of these figures, it's made by the same person. The resemblance is just so clear. But when we don't have the provenance of where the objects come from, it's even more difficult. So in most cases, it's impossible to trace. But yeah, I would point you to Gigi's work. She, she's the gal on that. <laughs> Fantastic. Any final questions for today? We have a question online on Zoom. Yep. Um, did any of the figures depict people of known Egyptian origin? Sorry, Valentina, we can just about hear you. Was that figures of non-Egyptian origin? Exactly, exactly. Uh, there's been some that have been interpreted as non-Egyptian origin. I would be very, very hesitant to label these things. The same with gender as well. They very quickly get labeled by their gender. I would want more evidence. Uh, there is one figure that comes to mind on one of the boats in the Ashmolean where the skin has been painted completely black rather than the usual red or the yellow. He's interpreted as being Nubian. But there's a lot of the time... I don't like to say crudely carved because I love them, but they're slightly more rustic. So it's really, you haven't got those defined facial features that people often use for trying to assign ethnic origins to them. So it's something I tend to shy away from in my research. I'm sticking with the quantifiable. It has an oval face. It has a square face. It has a nose. It doesn't. So I'm, I'm trying to stay away from that because it's, it can be very, very complicated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have enough time? Okay. Oh, good. I will use my position as chair to ask a question as well. Uh, the question I have is how, because I know from talking to you outside of the conference, how do you identify between fakes, pastiches, and real objects? If you can elaborate. Yeah. Thank you, Ruben. It can be really, really tricky, and I've gone down a complete rabbit hole with my research, looking at the fake examples and the pastiche examples as well. So there have been instances where museums have destroyed model boats, for instance, because they were a fake. It's then turned out later, these stylistic traits are actually present on another bo mo uh, model boat from a secure provenance, and we probably shouldn't have done that. By the same time, things we thought were originally genuine, later they turn not, not to be. You can do scientific analysis on these things. Oh, we've lost another poster in the room. <laughs> um, you can do scientific analysis. You can look at possible dating and things, but it's quite a detrimental pro process to the object, and the amount of data I'm going to gain by doing that analysis isn't really worth it for the purposes of my thesis. I did get advice from a, a colleague who works at Cardiff in the conservation department, and he said, yeah, for the purposes of your study, you really don't need to be doing the damage to the objects. Also, I don't think many museums would be keen on me taking little samples out of their objects. Again, the handling in person is really, really important for trying to figure out fakes. If you've got an ancient piece of wood, it's a lot lighter than you think it's going to be because all the moisture has been drawn out of it, whereas something a little bit more modern feels a little bit more heavy. You get used to the feel of the wood, that it feels right for something that's coming from that kind of origin. And a lot of it is just on intuition. When you look at a lot of these things that have been labeled as a fake, a lot of the time it is just on the inter uh, interpretation of the person viewing it. Uh, there's been a few in my corpus where they've been deemed as fakes by people who've examined them from photographs. When you get to see them in person, like the lovely one in the Egypt Center, he actually has a really clear provenance. There's really clear parallels to that rower. He's genuine. It's just he's been touched up a bit. And this issue of touching up really, really does impede, particularly with the model boats. Uh, if I refer to Emily Whitehead's work, she is looking at solar barks at the moment, and so many of those have had the rowers are real, but the hull's fake, or the hull's fake, but the canopy is real, and they've kind of Frankensteined things together a little bit to try and make it more appealing to the audience, to the viewer, to the buyer. So it's an absolute minefield trying to get through these things. I know I'm never going to clear it all up entirely, 
but at least if we can be very clear with our justifications of why we think this is a fake or why we think this is genuine, hopefully future researchers won't then be scratching their heads in the way that I am. <laughs>